everybody. Looks like we have a full house today, which is nice to see. Um, we have, we a, have large a large bill, bill in, front in front of us today, today with, with a lot of testifiers. testifiers. And, and so, so what, I think, what I think we're going, going to do is when Senator, when Senator Putnam, Putnam comes to the table, table we're going to ask that, that um, testifiers, um, testifiers who are, who are in, person, in person be ready, be ready to, go to go on the chairs, chairs on either, either side, side of him. him. So that, so that we can we make can a good use, use of time. time. We're, also We're also trying, trying to limit, limit uh, uh, give it a two-minute two window. window. Um, um, as, a as a teacher who used to grade, to grade a lot of speeches, speeches. I, know I know that sometimes, sometimes it can be hard, hard to figure out, feel, feel where that two minutes, two minutes is at. Is so, at. so if you if see you me see sort of like wave at you, just know that you're probably at that moment and that what you're saying is really important. So if there's something that you didn't get to say that you wanted to say, Please submit the rest of your testimony in writing, and we'll be sure to make sure that we distribute it to everybody because it's important that you you be heard today. Um, and I think I'm going to take a page out of Senator Putnam's playbook, and we might group um, questions after, or we might do questions after each group to sort of, if you know anybody on the panel or the committee has a question, um, they don't have to wait maybe all the way to the end, and we'll try to be as uh, Efficient, efficient with time, with time as, we as we possibly can. can. So, when, so you're when you're ready, ready Senator, Senator Putnam, please, please uh, come, uh, to, come the to the table. table. And if you, and if have, you have any testifiers, testifiers that you, that you um, um, let's see, I can list, list here as well, as well that want to come up first, first that, that would be, would be uh, uh, fantastic. fantastic. Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Chair, Chair and members. members. Uh, um, I, so I so much appreciate you hearing this bill. This bill. Uh, uh, it's, it's great to have an opportunity to talk about this stuff. And most importantly, Happy School Counselor Week. Uh, which, uh, which apparently, apparently it, is it is right now. Right now. Uh, uh, you know, you I, know I, first I first heard about the bar program, program from, my, from spouse. my spouse. Some of you, Some know, of you know is the, the superintendent, superintendent of schools, schools in 742. 742. A, friend a friend of mine had mentioned, mentioned to me, and I said, said hey, Laurie, I've, I've heard about this about program. This I hear it's pretty cool. cool. And she said, she said it's, it's not just pretty cool, it's amazing. Uh, and then and I started then I doing some of my own research, and I got to meet Angie Jarabek and talk to her about some of the things that she's doing. Members, this is a great, is a great opportunity, opportunity to, invest to invest in a proven model for helping our students. The bill that we have before us invests $7,650,000 over a course of three years in grants to the Bar Center. Bar stands for Building Assets, Reducing Risk. The Bar Center is a nonprofit organization based in St. Louis Park, founded and delivers the bar system to K-12 schools. Uh, SF-494's appropriation allows at least 30 Minnesota schools to implement and benefit from the BAR system. This would include on-site training, support aligning the system with existing school structures, curriculum focused on building intentional student-to-student -student and teacher-to-student relationships, professional development and coaching for three full years, and access to the Minnesota and national network of BAR educators. Uh, SF-494 states that schools selected for this grant must be geographically balanced among urban, suburban, and rural schools and serve high concentrations of students in poverty or underrepresented students, including students who are from black, indigenous, and people of color communities. Members, we often say that politics is about relationship, but anyone who's ever been in a classroom knows that that's what education is too. This is an opportunity to invest in and deploy a model in building relationships to help young people become their best adults. I uh, asked a friend of mine who's a principal at Apollo High School in St. Cloud for some kind of testimony or statement about his experience with BAR. And this is what he told me. Apollo High School is in its fourth year of the BAR program. BAR allows cohorts of ninth grade staff to use dedicated time to get to know and understand the needs of ninth grade students at a level we have never done before. With being able to focus on student needs and identify their strengths during their first year of high school, we're able to provide a unique educational experience for all our learners and provide for them what they need to be successful. Members, there's a good chance you all remember what it's like to be a freshman in high school. That's a difficult time in the best of days. These are not the best of days. But BAR provides a structure to help people through those early struggles. Now, Madam Chair, we are lucky to have with us today Angie Jarabek, the founder of BAR. Uh, she's published five books and several op-eds and articles in various publications, often looked to for her expertise. Angie Jarabek has been featured in USA Today, National Public Radio, and CNBC. She was asked to present at the White House Evidence and Education Roundtable in 2016 and has presented at international education events. 
In fall of 2020, she was awarded the Donald McNeely Center Social Entrepreneur of the Year by the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. In 2021, Jarabek was selected the Thomas B. Fordham Institute's National Wisest Wonk, which I hope you got a t-shirt for, um, an honor stemming from her submission to the Institute's contest designed to generate conversations surrounding critical issues within education reform. Jarabek's submission was titled, Reimagining Teacher Teams to Address Student Mental Health. Few things could be more important in our current moment. So Madam Chair uh, and members, uh, Angie Jarabek. Thank you so much. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Angie Jarabek, and I'm truly honored to be here today. So Building Assets, Reducing Risks, BAR, was started right here in Minnesota. In 1998, I was a high school counselor in a first-ring suburb of right outside Minneapolis, and half the ninth graders failed a course. This was the fifth year in a row. I was not feeling particularly successful, so I went to the principal to resign. He quickly said, no, it's not you. It's not our school, it's a national average. If you have a better idea, please come back to me. So a couple weeks later, I was sitting with my six-month-old son on my lap, my four-year-old daughter was sitting across from me, and my four-year-old daughter proceeded to pick up a handful of crayons and attempt to take a bite of them. I will say I was not feeling particularly successful professionally or as a parent. I'm like, thought we were past the crayon eating stage. So what do you do? You call your grandma. My grandma did not miss a beat. She immediately launched into the fact that she had taken my daughter to Sunday school the week before and she'd helped a girl who was really shy. And my sister had taken my daughter to the playground and she'd been really brave on the monkey bars. And all of a sudden I had a realization. I was a better parent because I had information from other adults when I wasn't there. I also realized a lot of that information were things that were working well. And I realized our schools did not have that. They had the 43 minutes where Eric might be struggling in math and they had no idea he was doing well in English, let alone did they know the information I had as a counselor that he was really involved in a synagogue and incredibly involved in community gardens. I was like, the issue with our schools has nothing to do with the, my colleagues. I work with amazing people. I also believe strongly that adults who choose to dedicate their professional lives to helping young people are incredibly gifted. I also knew this was not about the students. Our students are incredibly talented. This was an issue with the system, and we needed to reimagine the system, looking at things from a very different way. And we needed to focus on two pillars. One pillar was relationships. We needed to focus on relationships from staff to students, from students to students, but we also had to focus on relationships from staff to staff, especially if we were going to bring the pillar of data in. We needed to open up the grade books. This could no longer be between me and the student, or maybe me and this family. I needed the grade book to be opened so everybody knew what was going on. But to have that, I needed to have healthy staff-to-staff -staff relationships. I needed to look also at qualitative data. Was Gail sitting alone in the lunchroom? Did her friend group change? And how do I bring that information in? So that's really looking at the whole student. And that was how we were going to really see change. So an important context, when this was being developed, there was a number of initiatives being rolled out in education at the time that in the spirit of candor, me and my colleagues questioned the efficacy of. It didn't seem to make sense, but we were assured this was going to work. Well, bottom line is a number of these things have not worked. I committed myself, I would never ask any fellow educator to try to do something unless we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was going to be effective. So because of that, BARS always had an external evaluator verifying its impacts. So in 1999, our first funder came in and they were really interested in the reduction of risks, the building assets reducing risks. They wanted to look at cigarette use, alcohol use, suicide ideation, suicide attempts. So not only did that happen, the other big things that happened is our failure rate was cut in half in the first year. Over the next 10 years, the failure rate stayed cut, but we had an exponential number of kids taking AP, honors courses, and we were named in 2014 the ACT College and Career Going Model of the Year. And I kept thinking, this cannot just be with us. This absolutely is our overall work. So if you'll kind of hit that, that next slide, Hannah, the piece is um, we spent 20 years over $40 million, and we've been able to show statistical significance over and over and over again. I think the piece that's important is not only is this for all students, this in particular is for the students who are farthest from opportunity. 
Another key piece is this research shows the importance of treating education as professionals. We cannot give educators things that we don't know that work. So of the 40 schools that are doing this work in Minnesota, the vast majority have done this as part of this research and their work absolutely has to be applauded. I do encourage you, I know in your packet there's a letter from the American Institutes of Research and they will cite that this model not only is effective for students, staff, but it's also cost effective it's scalable and it's sustainable. So these are really critical things that we are really continuing to be able to move forward. So with this, I'm gonna show you a brief two minute video that captures the voices of the schools. So besides the data, you can hear their voices. In my experience in education, the BAR program has been one of the, has been the program that I've noticed the most difference immediately. Um, just the way that the meetings are structured, and when you see what's involved in it, it forces you to think about things in a different way, and then to recategorize how you're going to use people's time. I mean, utilizing the BAR method has really allowed us to turn the tide um, and show our students what they really can be. When you have teachers who are diligent um, and intentional about impacting their lives. BAR provided that platform for students to find themselves, to develop self-confidence, to learn how to socialize and communicate with each other. But at the same time, it also provided that other ability for our teachers to identify students before they slip through the cracks. What makes it so special is the community that we have here. The students are all one just giant family, and so are the teachers. And the teachers take every opportunity that they can to give us the opportunities that we need. Bar has forced us to focus in a way that everyone owns every scholar. So when we are implementing interventions, we are discussing and collaborating to ensure that we are making decisions that are best for our scholars at all times. And so BAR has really transformed the way that we do things. Intentionally, we meet every week, discuss every student, and we make sure that we find the thing that's for them. We get to know our students in a way that we know what their strengths are. We figure out what they really like and then we try to match them up with the appropriate thing in our building. BAR has really allowed us in the science department to get the kids engaged in what we're doing, share ideas, elaborate on each other's ideas, and really just focus on their learning and how we can really improve and um, really bring learning outside of the classroom in a comfortable environment for the students. But that is the beauty of BAR, is that it will work anywhere, any school, it works in rural America just like it does in urban, and it is because it allows a school to not have to reinvent everything they do, take what you're good at, what you provide students, but how do you connect those pieces and make it all work? I can honestly say in 26 years of education that BAR is unequivocally, hands down, the best program to help students I've ever seen. So what I want to say is I have absolute confidence that this model and the system is really bringing forth the talent that we have in our communities. And I am extremely excited and I feel also incredibly confident that students and teachers are most likely to change the world. Um, I'm going to talk, have Gail Totley um, speak briefly. Gail Totley has over 40 years of experience um, in both secondary as well as elementary. She was the president of the Minnesota School Counseling Association, as well as an administrator at Eden Prairie, and we're incredibly honored that she's now on the Bar Center Board of Directors. Thank you, Angie. Good morning. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Gail Totley, and I'm here to express my support for SF-494, which will bring the BAR system to more Minnesota schools, something I strongly believe in. I am past president, as Angie mentioned, of the Minnesota School Counselors Association, and my last position before my retirement for more than 40 years in education was serving as assistant principal at Eden Prairie High School. From my experience in education, I can tell you that it's the role of all school staff, counselors, social workers, psychologists, deans, teachers, administrators, to assure that students are successful. The bar system puts 
the critical important framework in place to support all school staff as they work every day to support the students they care so much about. For my decades in education, I've also been a witness, been a part of the relentless effort to close the achievement gap, something that persists to this date. As you heard from Angie, the significant research on the bar system proves that it closes the achievement gap between white students and students of color. With the bar system, we have a solution to closing the gap and we need more students to benefit by being, bringing bar in, in schools. Last and of significant importance to me, I joined the Bar Center's Board of Directors because I'm passionate about more schools benefiting from Bar's systematic approach to accepting the whole child. From my experience attending a segregated elementary school, then transitioning to one that was integrated I can assure you that seeing the whole child is absolutely critical to student success. I urge you to include BAR as part of the governor's and legislature's plan to make Minnesota the best state in the country for students to grow up in, a state with schools where all students have an equal opportunity to succeed. I am grateful to Chair for taking this up this important issue. Thank you for the opportunity to share my support for Barr. Thank you. Do any members have questions for these two testifiers? Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you so much for this presentation. Um, my, my only question is, um, will you just talk a little bit about the, the, the research behind it or the science behind it? Because I, I know that there is, and I think it's really important for all of us and for the record that we talk about that and, um, and just hear more about the evidence-based practice behind this. Madam Chair? Yes, thank you. Um, the research done was absolutely the most rigorous research. We did random assignment, which is rarely done in education. So there's been 78 schools that have been um, part of a randomized control, both within school as well as between school. And we were able to, once again, statistically have significant impacts. Statistically significant means reliable. And the impacts, as um, Gail referenced, is for all students. But the biggest impacts were for black, Latino, and students living in poverty. And so it both impacts test scores, GPAs, as well as their overall experience. The other piece is the impacts also for the teachers. So we were able to randomly assign teachers. And the teachers, in particular, also are being more supportive in this environment. Thank you. Senator Makeway, follow up. All right, thank you so much. Friendly reminder that we're gonna try to keep these to just uh, at the most two minutes. We do have another presentation after this bill, so anxious to hear your testimony. And again, if you have any further comments, you can always submit them in writing so we can hear the full story. Thank you. Um, make sure you state your name for the record before you begin. My name is Eric Norby. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Eric Norby. I'm the principal at Armstrong High School in the Robbinsdale Area School District. As a principal, I've seen the difference Bar has made in four years since we began implementation. It is through hard work and commitment of our administrative team and our teacher utilizing Bar as a framework that our school culture has changed for the better. Bar has enabled us to meet both academic and social emotional needs for our students. It has helped us empower our students to become excellent scholars and people. That's not just another thing to add on to a teacher's plate, but rather a way for schools to better serve our students, our community, and our teachers. Barr has permanently changed Armstrong High School. I can honestly say that. As I shared in my letter of support to the committee, Armstrong graduation rate has improved by 4% since 19, or 2018. And our students of color report more sense of, uh, sense of belonging and stronger relationships that Barr has helped nurture. I would like to introduce to you two excellent educators and our Barr coordinators at Armstrong High School, Dr. Ann Beaton and Tim Lloyd. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Ann Beaton. I'm a 27-year veteran teacher and have been a Barr co-coordinator for the past five years at Robbinsdale Armstrong High School. 
Since early in my career, I have been part of many attempts to build community and provide responsive support for all of our teachers and students at AHS. The BAR model has helped us, finally, find la lasting success and gain traction in our effort. Teachers have told us they feel supported by the BAR model too. One new teacher said, thanks to BAR, I have felt supported and included in the community from day one. If teacher retention is a goal, I feel BAR will pay, play a big part in making that a reality. And a veteran teacher reflected, I've gained student perspective through the eyes of another teacher on my team. My team's focus on student needs has resulted in my knowing students personally as people. And a counselor commented, this is exactly what I imagined counseling to be like when I left grad school. I urge you to fund the bar model in other schools around Minnesota so more teachers and students can experience the much needed support and success. Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Tim Lloyd and I, I am a teacher of 30 years in the bar co-coordinator for four years at Armstrong High School. I come here to represent the student perspective of the effects of bar at Armstrong High School. One student quoted that building relationships with new students on a personal level makes me feel more connected. When talking with another student, he asked me, how many students are at Armstrong? I replied about 2,000 and his response was, there is way, no way there are 2,000 people in this building. It feels way smaller. In terms of students feeling connected at Armstrong in 2019, uh, 2020, which was our first year of bar implementation, pre-COVID, we had 493 students participate in fall and winter activities. This year we have had 784 students participate in fall and winter activities. That is a 60% increase in participation over the past four years. I'm hopeful you will support this bill so thousands of our students can feel the same sense of belonging that our students feel. New and veteran teachers feel supported and the hard work but good work of educators is the right work getting traction for our students to succeed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Make sure, too, to sign your name in on the clipboard there as well. And I appreciate hearing the positive student feedback. That's really, that's really beneficial to the testimony. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? All right. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah, no, you're good. Thank you. Um, if you want to make sure you sign in, and then before you begin, state your name for the record, and you can begin testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Kristen Arndt. I'm a school psychologist at Lake Elmo Elementary School in the Stillwater Area School District. As a bar, as a as a school psychologist, I oversee how to integrate the systems of BAR into our multi-tiered systems of support. BAR helps teachers develop and implement um, interventions to help support students and also it supports the teachers. Before BAR, um, I was brought in or our team was brought in to support students uh, when, the, when the issues have become significant and, and, and difficult to address. Now, as a team through BAR's systems, we are we are talking. We are taking early. We're talking early on about students um, and their challenges, and we're, more importantly, we're talking about the student as a whole um, and addressing the challenges um, from many different perspectives through different lenses. We unpack each student's story through both qualitative and quantitative data. We have strong relationships with each students and the students, and we can intervene much earlier with stronger outcomes. Thank you. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Kelly Hoskins. Um, I'm a fifth grade teacher and a bar co-coordinator at Lake Elmo Elementary in the Stillwater School District. Um, bar has changed me as a teacher. I have been in the field for 23 years, loving majority of the minutes of it. Um, and there has never been another model that I have used that has been um, as reliable for me and has um, brought me to a chance where I've been able to be, feel respected and um, depend on my relationship as being reliable with my colleagues. It's not just one more thing that you're giving to teachers and to students. 
It transforms families. It transforms school culture. I've never felt so connected or had so many meaningful conversations to change students' lives. Our school culture has been transformed. How we look and feel and talk about students is positive and it's strength-based. Um, we are also results-oriented. We know that um, you know, we want to see improvements in academics and we want to see success in academics. Um, from starting the bar model in 2019 until now, our MCAs have grown an average of 10.2% um, just in math, um, which is huge considering the state that we are all in and all of the challenges we have overcome in the last few years. Um, this year our focus is on literacy and our most recent scores indicate that students are meeting and exceeding their growth goals for their, student, for their current year as well. But BAR isn't simply a model that we use to improve our academics. It also helps us in getting students to become well-rounded and make everyone feel included. Um, it was a challenge for us because we were the first elementary school in Minnesota to use this. And so we had to navigate taking a high school model and breaking it down to work for an elementary um, setting. From doing our models, um, the depth that I have gained, the depth of knowledge that I have gained has been huge. Um, I had a child that had just immigrated from Mexico and he um, could barely speak English. He also had autism and he was, his behaviors were at a first grade level. As a fifth grade teacher, I was very stressed out about how to help this child. How was he going to interact with other students? How was he going to make friends? let alone how was I going to teach him when I'm trying to teach a fifth grade curriculum. Because of BAR, I was able to bring him to a meeting and get tons of feedback from my colleagues and tons of ways to help him. He ended his fifth grade year feeling respected, honored, and happy. Um, all of my students are set up for success with BAR, and if it wasn't for BAR, I wouldn't know that one of, um, by doing the U time, I wouldn't know that one of my students' goals in middle school was to be a swimmer. And because of that goal and because of the community connect meetings we have with Barr, I was able to um, connect him with an actual really qualified swimming instructor because um, he didn't know how to swim. <laughs> so we were able to get him swimming lessons in the community and now he's on track to meet that goal. So. BAR has truly made a difference for myself, my families, and our whole community. On behalf of my colleagues at Lake Elmo, we thank you for the opportunity to share and hope that you will support this bill so more schools can experience these positive outcomes for their schools. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do any of the members have questions? I have a quick question, if that's OK. Um, you talked about you time and community connections. Can you just briefly define what those two things are? It sounds like that's kind of an important part of the process. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you times are the social emotional curriculum that Bar gives you. Um, it is 20 to 30 minutes, sometimes 40 a week that teachers do these lessons with students. Um, and so it can range from doing something that's kind of self-reflective to kind of like an icebreaker type thing um, or to a goal like who, the person they want to be later on in life. Um, and so that just really helps bring our kids together and also work on their goals as far as who they want to be and how they are going to get there. The Community Connect is um, a team that meets weekly at every school, and it's made up of different members, our psychologists, um, principal coordinators, and they deal with the children that maybe have the higher needs um, or some things that are not usually seen in school um, or that might be bigger than a school can handle, death of a family, home, a family member, homelessness, um, foster care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Make sure to sign in. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome. Make sure you sign in and state your name for the record, and you can begin testimony whenever you're ready.
Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Joseph Held, and I'm an associate principal at White Bear Lake Area High School in White Bear Lake. So I want to say, first of all, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Last year, I had the opportunity to share this testimony with your committee, and I'm thankful to be able to be here again on behalf of White Bear Lake. So as an administrator, BAR has transformed the culture in our school in many, many ways. It's very powerful. And what it's done for us administratively is that I'm allowed to learn from my students, my staff, and my families in truly unprecedented ways. And I feel like I have a pulse on what's going on in our school. We've seen our school teachers collaborating in ways that you'll hear about more soon. And it has truly been amazing. I would say lastly, and I addressed this in my letter um, that I sent earlier, but we have had tremendous academic success, <clears throat> excuse me, and our behavior, reoccurring behavior concerns have gone down, so much so that our district has saw fit to include BAR in both of our middle schools and a number of our elementary schools, and we hope to add more in the coming days. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I'm excited for you to hear from some of my colleagues about the success that BAR has had in White Bear Lake. Madam Chair, committee members, good morning. My name is Tony Walford, and I'm a social studies teacher at White Bear Lake Area High School, North Campus. BAR has not only helped improve student outcomes, but it is also beneficial for teacher well-being. Our teachers' mental health has improved, as well as our efficiency in working together to collaboratively solve problems and support students. BAR allows us to work with a common set of teachers and focus that on supporting the needs of each student. Through BAR, we are able to collectively address student concerns as well as celebrate student successes. Thank you. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Amanda Schrader and I'm the BAR coordinator from White Bear Lake Area High School in White Bear Lake School District. I'd like to share a story quickly about a student whom we've seen grow in both personal confidence and his academic abilities. After learning that one of our students was facing a number of challenges outside of the school day, a group of his teachers created a project that would cover all standards required for their three courses. Our student took this project to heart and soared to success. Beaming with pride when he submitted the completed work, it was evident that now our student felt seen, welcomed, believed in, and for the first time, successful. On behalf of my colleagues from White Bear Lake Area High School and all of our schools in the district who are benefiting from BAR, thank you for the opportunity to share and I am hopeful you will support this bill so more schools can experience these positive outcomes for their students and families. Thank you. Members, any questions? I have a quick question. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate what you had to say about uh, teacher mental health. Can you talk about how this benefits teachers specifically with how it makes their jobs, you know, easier or more efficient or streamlined or whatever the word is that you would use to describe it? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for your question. Um, we're able to work just so collaboratively. We don't feel like we're on an island anymore when addressing student concerns. We're able to, we're in a better position to bounce ideas off of each other or even communicate in real time on students that are having good days, bad days, students that have stepped out of their shell and we can promote students as they're walking into the classroom. Hey, I heard in language arts say you did this. That's awesome. That's good to hear. And you tend to notice those changes in students over time. Like they're, they're happy to be supported and happy to be celebrated, which does a lot for them in class and what you're able to push them to do. And at the end of the day, you leave feeling like you are more effective in your job. Thank you. Senator Swadzinski. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm reserving my comments and questions for when everybody's done, but I just want to applaud. Um, I've never seen people lining up to testify next, and the enthusiasm I felt on third floor this morning by this group was infectious. So thanks for making a Tuesday morning um, start to my day after a rough commute so wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next testifiers, whenever you're ready, um, please sign in before you begin and then state your name for the record. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Josh Omang and I'm the principal at Detroit Lakes High School in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. It was important for us to be here today in person 
to talk about this amazing program and give you an outstate perspective on what this can look like. I am here today to share the tremendous impact that Barr has had on our high school in just one and a half years. Our community in Detroit Lakes serves a student population that is close to 25% American Indian and another 25% socioeconomically disadvantaged. It was very important to me as a school leader to find something that could help all students have success and ensure that no student falls through the cracks. BAR has been that solution for us. Since we brought this system into our school, I've seen a significant change in our school culture at every level. The BAR system truly does get results. I am happy today to have a few of my colleagues here to share more about the amazing results that we have been getting in Detroit Lakes. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Kelly Kalina. I am the BAR coordinator at Detroit Lakes High School. Uh, when looking at our data last year, our first year of doing BAR, we didn't want to compare the data to uh, any pandemic data, so we compared it to the last school year that was not affected by COVID, the 18-19 school year. Our 2022 year-end data showed that our 10 through 12th grade students decreased failure rates 27%, and our 9th grade failure rates decreased over 42%. The initial data for this semester in this school year shows that our, our numbers are, are crushing last year's numbers already. One of our biggest goals this year was to target our students with three or more Fs, which we would consider our at-risk students from dropping out and not graduating from high school. The number of at-risk students in our 10th through 12th grades decreased 44% from the previous year, and our ninth grade at-risk numbers went down 77%. <coughs> Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Callan Malcho, and I'm a social studies teacher from Detroit Lakes High School. Speaking purely from a classroom teacher perspective, I can tell you the structure that BAR puts in place with its social emotional lessons, which we call I-Times, um, is incredibly effective at building connections uh, with my students. They're purposeful, they're effective at reaching all students. I've been teaching for 31 years, and for many of those years, <laughs> Uh, I felt like, as one of my colleagues from what Berlick mentioned, I was on an island dealing with teacher, or students that struggle. Um, it was me and them, and I couldn't figure out what the problem was, and quite honestly, I'd wait till the semester ended and kind of walk away from it and go, well, not my problem anymore. And that, professionally and personally, builds on a person. With the bar meeting system, teachers communicate and share strategies how to meet the needs of these students. We have far more collaboration and direction with helping students. The data shared by Mr. Kalina reaffirms the effectiveness of this crucial part of the BAR program. We're hopeful that our district can expand BAR into our middle and elementary schools, and we know so many other Minnesota schools could benefit from BAR. Therefore, we ask for your support of this bill, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions, members? All right, thank you so much. Our next testifiers are online, so we'll make sure that they're with us. Um, do, we'll go with uh, Principal Jason Harris first from Tech High School, St. Cloud, if you want to unmute to begin your testimony when you're ready. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, committee members. Thanks for having us this morning uh, virtually. Um, Jason Harris, Principal of Tech High School, St. Cloud Area Schools. Here's what we know. Minnesota performs well compared to all other states on standardized test scores, graduation rates, and college readiness. However, we have some of the largest gaps in the nation on these measures by race, socioeconomic status, and even wider with the pandemic. As my fellow educators have already shared, we know the bar model works increasing academic achievement for all students. Each one of you want a BARS program within your school districts. Through the pandemic, we've seen great success. I have three other folks here in the room. 
I even have a treat of a student here today that's been through the bar program, and it's just an icing on the cake for you all to hear like this testimony from this young lady. So I'm gonna turn it over. This is a good investment. Put our money towards our future. Uh, the model works. And so I'm gonna let my bar coach, uh, Jenny Shaw, tell you the data of what we've seen through the pandemic and what we continue to do around graduation rates and building a culture. If you're ever in St. Cloud, come visit us, and I'll let uh, these three young ladies just share some of the testimony here today. Thanks for having us. Madam Chair, uh, committee members, my name is Jennifer Shad, and I am the bar coordinator for Tech High School. Uh, I began with bar as a counselor for, for the first four years. So five years ago, we started bar, in the 2018-19 school year. We started small with one team of 97 students. Uh, the thing that I am passionate about is looking at the data and the growth, um, which definitely shows that the seeds planted in ninth grade are coming to fruition. Uh, our current, uh, the, sorry, the, um, the first year of those 97 uh, students I analyzed the graduation rates of them as they graduated in 2022, and 89% of our students who experienced bar as a ninth grader graduated within four years. 89% is well above the state average. Uh, I have additional data if anyone wants to um, ask about that. As I've looked at the data for our current seniors as well, that was our second year of bar. Um, and they are well on the way to exceed that percentage for graduation within the, the students who had bar as well. Um, the statistics that I shared, I hope show that bar is seeing students, supporting students, and making sure that students are finding success. Okay, hello, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Chelsea Boker, and I'm a teacher at Tech High School. This is my fifth year as a member of a bar team. I'm here today to share some examples of student success. Traditionally, schools focus their time and energy on the high achievers and the low achievers, leaving the middle to be average. My bar team gives the same attention to all, including and especially the often overlooked middle. We pull kids into our meetings and look at their data with them. We teach them how to use it like we do. Together, we set goals, provide help, teach kids to advocate, and encourage them to join clubs like student council or track team, depending on their own strengths and their own interests. We've even convinced many to enroll in honors and AP courses to challenge themselves. Overall, our bar kids pass their classes and do well because they know their strengths and they know that their science, math, social, and English teachers plan for the individual success twice a week at our meetings. The data really does speak for itself. Thank you. Here's your treat right here. <laughs> <laughs> We're so excited to hear from our student testifier, but um, we don't have a name, so if you could state and spell your name for the record, that would be wonderful. And then whenever you're ready, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Naipaul Judge, N-Y-A-P-A-L-J-I-E-C-H. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee member. My name is Naipaul Judge, and I am a senior at St. Cloud Tech High School. I have benefited greatly from the bar program during my freshman year of high school. In my second trimester of freshman year, my grades dropped drastically, and I felt embarrassed and ashamed of my academic performance. But instead of giving up on my tri trimester, my bar teachers helped me improve my grades quickly and rallied around me to help me get on track and graduate. And now I've been accepted into the University of Minnesota Duluth. And because of this, I feel a sense of belonging in that my teachers know me and care about me. And I hope to see this program expand to other Minnesota schools so we can hear other success stories like mine. Thank you. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Members, do you have any questions? Senator Aaron McQuaid? <laughs> Thank you, Madam. Full name. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, it's funny because I'm sitting here um, both realizing that I had a teacher who was a bar um, coordinator and I was off in the middle overlooked student, and I'm just having that whole realization, but when I was in high school, everyone just called me Aaron May. No one ever called me just Aaron, so full, full circle. But um, 
I, I wanted to ask, this is just really incredible, and, and um, Senator Zwazinski talked about like what a wonderful Tuesday this is and what a wonderful testament to the, to the thing that you've built and um, having that student, congratulations on your, your path forward, like that's huge. Um, I just want to, I want to hear a little bit about um, like challenges and how you've overcome them too, because I think when you hear about all the great stuff, like that is what we want to hear in this committee and we want to know like what, how has it developed through the hard stuff too, especially COVID? Madam Chair? Yes, thank you. Um, the development, I think, while you're hearing it, it resonates with why educators chose this profession. It's providing them a path forward, and they want to see the whole student. So I think those are the things that are, in particular, going really well. Um, we maintained our study, the federal study, during COVID. We were the only one that kept the study going because I thought, well, if school's operating, relationships and data should be guardrails that are able to show impacts, and we were able still to be able to see those incredible impacts. The, the challenges, I think, continue to be the, the silos of schools, both of students as well as the schools themselves. So another piece that you haven't heard is all of our schools work together across the nation. So we have 220 schools that we have um, monthly calls that they join. We have a yearly meeting that rotates between Minnesota and California where we have over 500 to 700 educators getting together. So when a school is having a challenge on whatever, virtual graduations, and they solved it in Compton, California, Minnesota is going to learn from it. And when Detroit Lakes has a solution, we're going to be sharing it with Maine. So we really are, how do you break up the silos within the schools, but also between the schools? But in terms of challenges, I think the legacy um, tradition of schools is probably the biggest challenge. And how do you change that? Thank you. Yep. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can you, you know, we're hearing a lot about the success, but um, we're looking to put uh, over $7 million into this. Can you help us understand how that money is going to be used? Um, and is it going to be in Minnesota schools? You're saying you're in other states, so can you help us understand? I get some of it might be research that'll go everywhere, but is this mostly for Minnesota schools? Madam Chair? Yes, thank you. So this money would be only Minnesota schools. And I actually want to hearken back to so many Minnesota schools participated in this federal research and wanting to be able to expand this model. So the model, it's, um, it would be 30 schools. Each school, uh, the model, it lasts three years. Because of research, we know there isn't a tail. We really train and coach a school in this model for three years. Each school, it costs $75,000. They get a dedicated coach. They get the curriculum. They get the materials. They get a, um, and after three years, they're able to continue to keep in the model themselves. So it would basically fund 30 schools over three years to be able to do this model and continue to grow. Thank you. Senator Rarick? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, when you talk, does that become uh, an employee of the school district that becomes that coach, or is it somebody your organization provides for them? The, Go ahead. The, um, we coach the school. So they will get a bar coach, and each you know, coach works with, you know, 10 to 12 schools, but they literally talk to them sometimes daily, at minimum weekly, and they're coaching them in this new model, this new operation, but they are coaching somebody at the school. So we simply say, you need to, so you heard many people have dual roles, because we need this to be their community, because we truly believe each community has the information, but we're teaching them the model. Does that answer your question? Yep. Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So then the schools that testified here, they all have completed the program with you, and so now they are running their own programs alone. Is that correct? Ma'am? Summer, like Detroit Lakes, is a year and a half in. So, and some of the schools also um, have continued on in a lighter touch. So um, the vast majority, I think Lake almost maybe in their third year. So they're, they're within that, that, that window. Armstrong is, is past that. There is some other um, work that they're continuing to stay part of the network, but yes. It's the three-year model, if that's the, the question. Thank you. Uh, Senator Swazinski. Well, um, thank you for um, bringing this forward, Senator Putnam. It's been a, a joy listening to such enthusiastic presenters this morning. Um, during the height of COVID, I stopped asking all my teacher friends and colleagues, how's your year going? Because I didn't like what they were saying, and I didn't want to hear them talk about how horrible their year has been been. And so I stopped asking them and I started asking them what's the silver lining of COVID. 
and what good's going to come out of this? And I loved answering that question because it just changed the course of the conversation. And to summarize from dozens of teachers that I asked, they said exactly what your program does is we're going to get back to the holistic child and we're going to start um, stop worrying so much about the academic needs of the child and we're going to start listening to their emotional and social and physical needs um, more equally to their academic needs. So whenever I get presented with ideas to help um, move that forward, I'm, I'm giddy. Is, is that a word, giddy? Wow, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I have a lot of ideas, so if you ever want to meet with me, I, um, I know Ms. Totley knows how, how much I tried during my teaching career to take a giant school and just make it a little bit smaller, either by the programs I created or um, um, being a, a, the Jewish guy that hosted the Christmas party every year for the staff, um, just little things we can all do to make these. And uh, you guys gave us a lot of really good data and we appreciate that, but the two takeaways for me isn't the data you presented to me. It's these two quotes I wrote down. Someone said the school culture is transformed. And um, to a 33-year educator, that's music to my ears. And then the, um, I think it was the video of the, the student said, I feel like I'm part of one giant family. And um, those, those things speak volumes, much more for me anyways than data. And, um, but I do have a question. And, um, and I don't know, uh, I, I do believe it was the Soul Studies teacher from Detroit Lakes that said it. Um, he called it I time, and uh, I, unless I missed it, I have no idea what happens during I time that would help these students end up saying things like, I've, it, we've become one giant family. And um, so with that said, I'll um, thank you for the testimony today, and thank you for bringing this bill forward, Senator Putnam. Madam Chair. Thank you. So there are, uh, uh, for elementary, it's called U times. For high school, it's called iTimes. I will say this was before iPhones, it was before any of those different things. And I said, as a ninth grade counselor, guys, it's all about them. We need 30 minutes a week that we are just going to say, what's going on with you? So the lessons, I also, I'll say I teacher-proofed. I went to the teachers that are like the least touchy-feely and said, would you do this lesson? And if they said no, then I'm like, i got to rewrite it. So it's a 30-minute lesson to get to know you. So an example would be, what's on your plate? And I'm going to say I have two kids I like to run, and they're going to share things with me, but it's a mutual sharing. So I'm not teaching them SEL. We're actually learning to be in relationship together. But every week, these lessons are being done across the classes that we're able to actually feel like a family and get to know each other. I also um, know it's ways to actually like, learn skills of how do you start a conversation. So the high school is called I-Time, and elementary is called U-Times. Senator Sudzitsky. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate uh, all of the testifiers and uh, description of the, the legislation here, proposal. Uh, I have a couple questions regarding one of the slides here, and this would be to the bill author. If he could explain, uh, I'm on the slide here that talks about relationships and data. And so in regards to the data portion of it, it says that there's quantitative and qualitative data. And one of the things that's always in the uh, forefront of my mind when I see data is what kind of data is collected. So I have a series of questions here. Starting with that one, what data is collected? I don't, uh, Senator uh, Lucero, I don't have the slides with me, so I don't see that specific thing, but I can say in general, uh, quantitative data is that which is numerical and produced by uh, an objective process. Qualitative data is narrative in form. And when you have uh, qualitative data, you look for themes within uh, the narratives. Uh, it is a uh, standard and well-accepted practice for academics in the social sciences. But to get a little bit more specific, uh, perhaps Ms. Jarabek can answer. Madam Chair, can I be more specific? I'm sorry, Senator Lucero, go ahead. Thank you. I, I absolutely know the difference between qualitative and quantitative data. What I'm asking is exactly what metrics, what data points are being collected on students. Sure. Madam Chair? Yes, thank you. So BAR is not collecting any of the data. We're going to be working with the school. So metrics that typically we'd be looking for would be attendance, 
behavior coursework, the ABCs. So we're going to have the school be looking at their trends. So the fact that the schools are able to share with ease kind of what are the, what are the failure rates. Those aren't data that typically you're going to be running quickly. Schools tend to get those post-mortem to say, oh, that was what happened. So we're really working with them to use their data systems, whatever they have, and be able to be really familiar with what does the data look like, and at the same time, add that qualitative data. So if, in fact, that I saw, well, your attendance has changed, I'm going to also say, has your fun group changed when I walk through the lunchroom? Kind of what are those things looking? So we're looking at quantitative weight, qualitative data, but we're really having the school be familiar with their systems so they can be able to see the whole student. Senator Lucero, follow Thank up. You. Thank you. So is there a new system that any of this data, so the schools have, let's say, an attendance record. Is there a, under this program, is there a new system that's developed that information is exported or imported into? Or is it, it sounds like, uh, by the nod of your head here, it, it appears that it's more of a taking existing systems, looking at the data, not moving the data, not sharing the data, not data mining the data uh, in a new application, but instead uh, analyzing the existing data that is already there in repositories that might already exist in the school district. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. Yes. We are not, we are actually having the schools become much more familiar with their data system. We don't, we use whatever system they have, but we need them to be really trained for training them to be able to pull their own data and be able to look at it in real time ways and add that qualitative piece of those observations. But That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, members? All right. Um, Senator Putnam, final, final notes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for hearing this bill. And thank you, members, for listening attentively and appreciating all the folks who showed up today. Um, and I also want to thank our bipartisan group of co-authors. Uh, we had the assistance here of uh, Senator Gustafson, Senators Coleman, Swadzinski, and Duckworth. Uh, not just bipartisan, but people from all around the state who appreciate the need that we are presented with today. And I also want to take an opportunity to thank our friends, Representative Dabney and, Rep and Senator Weir, who have been helping us put all this together uh, and helping us really understand it, it a little bit better. Now, now, members, I want you to take your senator half off for just one second and be a human being. Uh, and remember what it was like to be 15. It was awful. <laughs> Isolating, lonely. But also take a second and imagine what it's like to be a teacher and to see people struggle with that. How frustrating and isolating that itself can be because people go into education because they want to help people. Imagine not feeling like you're able to do that because you're alone. Members, this is a simple bill. As Senator Eric mentioned, it's, it's a bit of money. But we got a real big problem. This fixes that problem. We should give it money. That's all I got. Thank you so much. Um, we, one moment. We're going to lay this over. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the testimonies. I also like seeing uh, people from my own school district in my own White Bear Lake um, and my hometown, St. Cloud. So thank you. <laughs> we'll be moving on to the school trust lands presentation. When the, test, when the presenter and testifier are ready, they can state their name for the record and begin. I did not mean to share my big bass picture again, but I apparently keep doing it. Good morning, Madam Chair, members. Aaron Vandalin, School Trust Lands Director. 
Um, and thank you for the opportunity today. This is um, just a quick overview on a, a little known funding mechanism inside um, the education finance for Minnesota schools. Uh, just real quick on the presentation, I'll go through a little bit of history. Uh, one slide on school trust lands. I will talk about the school trust portfolio. Get into uh, some revenue numbers and some distribution numbers, how this uh, funds education in the state. And then a little bit on what our office is charged with doing. So um, just real quick on the history side of it, this is, um, this is from <laughs> the, early part of our uh, country and when we were moving westward uh, with Manifest Destiny, the founding fathers uh, could not fund education in the rest of the country as the new states came into the country. And under the equal footing doctrine, they actually have to put all states on the same footing. So the way they did that is um, granted land to all the states that came into the into the union. So Minnesota was the first state to receive two sections of land, section 16 and 36 across the state. That was uh, roughly a 2.5 million acre land grant from the federal government. That happened right at statehood. Uh, we also received three other different federal grants that totaled about 8.1 million acres. Uh, we have sold off about five and a half of those million acres. Most of uh, the land that was sold is in the southern part of the state and on the western part of the state. So think your ag lands where the uh, pioneers would move to. And um, what we have left in the two and a half million acres is mainly in uh, 10 counties in northern Minnesota. So a little bit about the portfolio itself. Uh, I, I talk about the school trust as having two main assets. One is the land asset that I just mentioned. That's two and a half million acres. Uh, we also have um, that land generates revenue. That revenue goes into a fund. The fund is inviolate. It means it can, the corpus cannot be spent. It's invested by the State Board of Investment and then distributed to schools each year. Um, the historic revenue from the, that's in the financial asset right now in the portfolio comes from minerals, forest products, real estate sales, and then the investment proceeds. So minerals makes up the vast majority of that wealth that's in that permanent school fund. Uh, today, the fund is valued at $1.7 billion. That every year spends off interest and dividend payments. Uh, that is then certified by Minnesota Management and Budget as the spendable income, and then that is what is distributed to schools. Um, another another sh um, map, or just a map now, I. Uh, of, of where the school trust lands are in those uh, 10 northern counties, mainly in those 10 northern counties. And as you can see, it's um, a lot of land in Kuchiching County and uh, Itasca and St. Louis County. And uh, that should come as no surprise because that's where the mineral wealth is in Minnesota. Uh, we also, as you can see, we do have um, some commingling of school trust lands inside reservation boundaries. It's uh, an, an issue that we, we will need to address in the future. So revenue generation, uh, just last fiscal year, uh, the gross revenue received was roughly $42.5 million. The majority of that came from one mine in Minnesota, and that's Mintac's, uh, or U.S. Steel's Mintac mine in, mine, in, mine in Mountain Iron. That's a mouthful. So that $42.5 million, will, uh, DNR will certify its costs against, um, its management costs against those revenues. We anticipate that the net revenue that'll be deposited will be in the 28 to $30 million range. And then if you look on the um, other side of the slide, what was distributed this year to school districts across the state is $39 million. That's distributed based on the um, ADM formula that's in statute. It equates to roughly $45 a pupil. Um, I, I, I say that and we have to own that it's only $45 when we recognize that there's a very large uh, budget for education in Minnesota. Uh, the one thing I like to point out is that the school districts have, um, they do not have to come to the legislature for this $39 million. It is, it is distributed to them in uh, half in September and half in March. And the, um, the other thing that I like to point out is uh, the majority of that revenue, regardless that the uh, 2.5 million acres are mainly in northern Minnesota, the majority of that revenue comes to the metro. Is roughly 55% of the students are in the metro school districts. 
So this is the, the most distribution we've ever seen, um, and I, I would say that's a testament to the State Board of Investment and how they manage those funds. So a little bit on our office. I am the uh, first of my kind in Minnesota. Um, Governor Dayton appointed me as the first school trust lands director in 2015. It was established in 2012. Uh, Governor Walls just recently reappointed me uh, to another four-year term. Uh, we have uh, two and a half uh, of us in our office, uh, and we have a, a large job, and that's to establish the strategic planning uh, for school trust land management over the next 25 years. Uh, we also have an advisory role to the executive and the legislative branch and work hand in hand with the Permanent School Fund Commission on legislation that can improve the school trust assets and the portfolio balances. So I mentioned the 25-year uh, management framework that we're charged with doing. Uh, we've been working on that project with DNR for a little over four years. Um, so we got way delayed like most with COVID, but um, the asset management plan uh, that we're developing, believe we believe that that will set us up for 25 years of um, management policy frameworks. And if you look the, on the screen, um, these are the goals that were established in statute for that 25 year management framework. I'd, I'd point out um, the fourth and the fifth um, are things that we have actually started to work on a little bit more in our office, and that's balance the revenue enhancement and resource stewardship. And then um, two years ago, uh, our office went back to the legislature and said, we are not directed in this um, management plan to look at uh, carbon markets or ecosystem service markets, and we're missing an opportunity there from a revenue standpoint and from a resource stewardship standpoint. So the legislature graciously uh, gave us new legislation um, and added this on to it. So that has uh, been implemented now into, or included now in our asset management plan. That um, plan will be finalized here in the next couple of weeks and presented to the Permanent School Fund Commission. And then we will start working on implementation. And I want to back up and point one thing out. This map that's on on the left here, the, the green, um, those are all the school districts in the state. And that is an interactive map that is on our website. If um, you want to see how much um, revenue your school districts get, or the school districts in your district get, you can go on there and uh, just click on the school district. It'll pull up the number of students and the distribution that they receive this year. Madam Chair, and that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator May Queen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question. You talked about the commingling of, of school interests and um, reservations, and that's something we'd have to address in the future. Can you just say a little bit more about what that means and why in the future? Thank you. Madam Chair, Senator May Quaid, members, uh, the The, the way the original legislation and the Enabling Act legislation was written in Minnesota, or by Congress for Minnesota, was that if we receive school trust lands, or if school trust lands in a section 16 or a 36 were inside a reservation boundary underwater or already conveyed, then the federal government was required to replace that land with what's called the in lieu selections. So there is, um, just to put some numbers out there, there's roughly 16,000 acres, I believe, in the White Earth Reservation. I believe there's 142,000 acres inside the Leech Lake Reservation, a few thousand inside the um, reconstituted Mille Lacs Reservation boundary. So uh, we have to work with the federal government on, on resolving some of those issues and the tribal governments as well. Senator McQuaid, follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I feel like I might have just waded into a bigger conversation than I was planning on getting in, but I appreciate that makes sense, and thank you. Senator Swazinski. This is a history lesson for me, uh, the question I have. So if each um, township had two sections that were set aside for the schools, and looking at the map, there's just the northern half has all these counties with dozens of townships with no school trust land. I'm assuming that land was sold at some point, and did the legislature 
have to approve that land sale or where did the money go during these land sales or am I not interpreting Minnesota history properly? Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Madam Chair, or excuse me, Senator Swissinzi, um, members. The, the histories of, uh, I'll do my best. I am a history major, so don't hold this against me. Then the bar is high. The bar is high, I, I recognize that. Uh, we still have a, a statute on the books that says you cannot sell school trust lands for less than $5 an acre. I don't know if anybody would want that deal, but it's still on the books. Um, we sold off the majority of the land in southern Minnesota and western Minnesota, as I mentioned. That, that money went to the permanent school fund. So the real estate sales accounted for about 7% of that historic revenue. The land that is in um, northern Minnesota um, is not necessarily all s original school trust land section 16 and 36. I mentioned the other federal grants that we received. Um, so if you break down the two and a half million acres that we have left, about 900,000 acres is original section 16 and 36. The vast majority of it is uh, swamp trust land, uh, which under Minnesota Constitution is still treated as school trust lands because the revenue flows into that permanent school fund from the swamp lands. So the swamp lands were granted the, to the state, or the Swamp Act was extended to Minnesota in 1860, Minnesota and Oregon. Um, Minnesota took the approach of actually selecting the swamp lands that it would receive. So we selected all of the swamp lands. Uh, the majority of what is in uh, the Leech Lake Reservation is considered swamp trust. So we've um, selected those lands inside those reservation boundaries or elsewhere, um, and we capture that revenue now and put it in the permanent school fund. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And the testifier may not know the answer to this, but if he does, I'm curious. Uh, so it's pretty obvious how uh, land that might be in mining areas or uh, forestry areas would be able to produce revenue, but how would land that's in a swamp produce any revenue for the trust fund? Director Vandalin. Madam Chair, Senator Lucero and members, um, that is exactly why we went and got the additional legislation that allowed us to advance ecosystem service opportunities on school trust lands. So what we're looking at is uh, wetland banking markets, carbon sequestration markets, habitat markets, things of that nature, where you can actually sell credits on otherwise unproductive or uneconomic land and then generate revenue. But it also generates the revenue and then has the natural resource component as well. So we've, I think, balancing is what we're trying to do. Um, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of opportunity in the ecosystem service markets that we haven't tapped into yet. We've done a, a number of uh, projects, analysis projects already in uh, our office, uh, one around carbon sequestration, forest carbon sequestration, identified three 20,000 acre project areas, um, and we're just looking to advance those now. Senator Lucero? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And just to make sure, and that's, I appreciate that that's, uh, um, helps to bring some clarity. So uh, when a developer, let's say down here in the metro area, for example, wants to, to develop some property, build commercial or residential, and there's a, a portion of it that's in a swamp land, this is an example of where the two to one comes in, or it might be another uh, ratio, but a person, that developer then could buy credits to expand the wetland up in some of these school trust areas, if I heard you correctly, in, uh, in order to take away the swamp that might be part of the development. Director Vandalin. Madam Chair, Senator Lucero, members, uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, they have, um, so usually you want to do the, if there's a wetland impact, you want to do the restoration in the same watershed. So that there's, there's some rules that uh, the Board of Water and Soil Resources uh, have around that, and they're called HUCs. Um, but we've, we've done, um, the largest, we partnered on the largest wetland banking project, uh, the Lake Superior Wetland Bank, right outside of, um, uh, it's just south of Eveleth, so Cotton, Eveleth area. 
but it was the largest wetland bank in the nation. We, we partnered with Ecosystems Investment Partners to do that. Um, we, they bought some high value productive timber land, exchanged that for our school trust lands, and then they created the wetland bank that then was able to be sold. Those credits were sold to mining companies, county road projects, and other developers. But yeah, it's, you, re you really just can't take it from the metro and replace it with something that's up north. It has to be in the same watershed, or should be in the same watershed. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to the testifier. I definitely appreciate this uh, uh, education lesson this morning. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're doing a great job. Um, I, I, I feel like this is one of, this might not be a question, but it might be a question. I'd be interested in your opinion. There, we have a complicated history with how we fund our schools in the nation, in our state. And I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm learning right now that this actually might be part of that complicated history and funding mechanism and that it's not without um, some bad history behind it, I guess. If, is that accurate to say? Or if you're allowed to say that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Director Vandalin. Madam Chair, Senator Maquade, members, uh, I, I don't know that I want to give my personal opinion here on what happened um, with our forefathers and some of the acts um, that transferred lands or didn't transfer lands and things of that nature. Um, I, I, will, I, I should point out this school trust lands are, are bigger than just Minnesota. Wisconsin has you know, roughly 7,000 acres left. Um, our one mine in Minnesota produced almost as much revenue as Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa combined, and that was the, the Hill Annex mine. But there are 22 other states, 21 other states uh, west of us that have school trust lands, and that, that conglomerate of states manages over 500 million acres for education throughout the West. A lot of those states actually have oil and gas, and they do a lot better than us, but <laughs> it's oil and gas. Senator McQueen? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't think I should... I'm just like having a moment of I'm learning. You know, we have a lot of complicated ways that we fund education, many of them um, discriminatory, and I think this might be falling into that piece a little bit for me. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you, Director Vandalin. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. And with that, we are adjourned.